Hello, everybody. Happy noon time. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. People are still coming in. Um, while we're waiting to get started, if you could please introduce yourself in the chat by doing the thing that everybody does, saying your name, and then if you could please add your affiliation after your name um, in the chat. And if you can, modify your name um, by hovering over your picture, selecting the dot, 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 or the ellipses, and renaming so your name reflects your um, organization or affiliation. That would be really, really helpful. Okay, people are still clamoring in. Still clamoring. Hopefully you all have had a nice week. Right, we're still going. Wonderful to see so many familiar faces and names and great to see some recipients of uh, funding from the first and second grant rounds. It's really, it's excellent to see. Okay, things have definitely slowed down a bit. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming to our Lunch and Learn today. Uh, this is a Lunch and Learn to talk about a Wetlands Watch and Virginia Outdoors Foundation grant fund, um, the Coastal Resilience and Trees Fund that we're so um, graciously able to provide through Virginia Outdoors Foundation pass-through funding. Um, so thank you to VOF for making this grant possible. Uh, we'll do Wetlands Watch introductions and um, VOF introductions. If there are any VOF staff on the line, I'll go first. My name is Mary Carson Stiff. I'm the executive director of Wetlands Watch, and I have an interest in land conservation and, um, and policy and figuring out how we can protect our wetlands from drowning uh, from sea level rise. Next. Hi everybody, I'm Stacy McGraw. I'm the Director of Green Infrastructure at Wetlands Watch and the co-coordinator of CBLP, the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Program in Virginia, along with Shireen Hughes, who I will pass it to. Hello everybody, I'm Shireen Hughes. I'm Assistant Director of Wetlands Watch and I co-coordinate the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Program. And I love promoting and making sure that we get more of these natural and nature-based practices, resilient practices actually installed and working. So happy to see you all. Excellent. Savannah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Savannah Newburn. I'm the Flood Risk Project Manager with Wetlands Watch. Um, still fairly new. I started back in September, and I, I assist Stacy in some ways with administrating the Coastal Resilience and Trees Fund. Wonderful. Okay, Virginia Outdoors Foundation. Is there anyone on the call from VOF? I cannot really see my participant Emily list. Emily is on here. Oh, good. Hey, guys. You, you have the... Virginia Outdoors Foundation grants team. I'm Emily White, program manager. And uh, just like the title says, I'm here to listen and learn. I'm Emma Weaver. I also work with uh, Virginia Outdoors Foundation alongside Emily in the grants department. And we're happy to help support the mission of this grant program and 
we're available for any technical difficulties with the grant system. Thank you all. Great. So we're going to get started. Um, Stacy's going to share her screen and um, I'll provide the beginning part of this presentation and then Stacy will provide the rest. Stacy is our project lead on this grant program. Um, and so she's going to be uh, sharing the most about what we've been up to in the past year. And uh, for those of us, or for those of you who are just joining us now, could you please add your name and affiliation in the chat to introduce yourself to the group? And um, if you wanna change your name to include your affiliation, that would be great too. We're gonna present and then we'll have some time for questions and answers and discussion. And start recording now, Mary Carson. Yes, I actually did prior because I was so nervous I would forget. Okay, great. Thank you for doing all those introductions. Wonderful. Well, as has been stated, we are here to talk about the Coastal Resilience and Trees Fund, which is a, a partnership fund between the Virginia Outdoors Foundation and Wetlands Watch. Um, VOF has uh, provided the resources that make this grant program possible, and Wetlands Watch has developed the grant program in coordination with VOF staff and is the administrator of the grant. So why is this partnership a thing at all? Virginia Outdoors Foundation is the state agency land trust for Virginia. Um, they are body politic if you wanna get into the details of, of what the entity actually is according to the state code. But for all intents and purposes, they are the state agency land trust in Virginia. They are the, the largest uh, land holding organization in the state and have a very long history uh, and legacy of helping property owners protect their lands in perpetuity forever and ever um, against actions that are not consistent with uh, conservation purposes. <clears throat> VOF is not just a, a land trust, they also offer a ton of support through grants that will that help make our communities more vibrant, more resilient, and more um, and and provide more access uh, to properties through uh, public access programs, as well as um, kind of engagement with community members and community spaces. This um, this grant program is one of those grants. Uh, one of the many grants that the Virginia Outdoors Foundation provides. You can check out more of these grants on their websites, um, on their website. But as I mentioned, there are some that are about access to open spaces and providing um, various capacity support for conservation across the state. As you can see on the screen, they oversee 4,400 acres of open space and six reserves, uh, which they do in coordination with other state agencies working in this space. Um, VOF has been working in partnership with state, federal agencies, and nonprofits for um, decades and decades. And so this is just one more example of the way in which they coordinate and uh, use partnerships to drive their mission and their work uh, in the Commonwealth. Who are we? Wetlands Watch is a nonprofit. We're based in Norfolk, Virginia, but we work statewide and beyond on uh, conservation related efforts. Our focus is on how um, natural ecosystems that are shoreline adjacent and, um, and directly on the shoreline can survive and persist against the threat of development and uh, against the threat of, of sea level rise, which is a huge concern for our non-tidal and tidal wetlands. Um, just in case you all aren't aware, and it's a pretty shocking statistic, uh, if we don't create spaces for our wetlands to, to move under the threat of sea level rise, we are looking at 89% of uh, tidal wetlands lost by 2080 and 51% of non-tidal wetlands lost by 2080. So this is a, a big issue for our organization and it prohibits our ability to do our mission work. And so we are exploring all different types of programs. You can read about them on our website 
that look at how to develop solutions to this big problem of wetlands loss with climate change impacts. Conservation, as it turns out, is going to be one of the most important tools that we can all use to protect against wetlands losses in the face of climate change. And we're so grateful for this partnership because it helps us explore the linkages um, far beyond this grant program, but certainly with this grant program as well. We have a lot of technical expertise in the conservation landscaping and green infrastructure spaces, which is directly related to what is funded through the Coastal Resilience and Trees Fund. We like to work at the community level and the parcel level in our collaboratory program through the use of our Sea Level Rise phone app and through our Catch the King community science um, data collection event. And we, we work at multiple different levels, similar to the Virginia Outdoors Foundation, working in partnerships that are, are regional, um, that are statewide, and even national. We like to work through a collective impact model. We like to work through partnerships. Um, none of our work could be successful without the partnership of other organizations and individuals and, and governments. And so um, that's what we're all about. And uh, this is just one more example of how we're doing that work in the coastal zone in Virginia. All right, Stacy, next slide. So when the Virginia Outdoors Foundation approached us about wanting to fund work in uh, the coastal resilience space, we were thrilled and excited to be able to work with them on creating this new funding resource, which all of you know is so desperately needed in our coastal zone. So we developed um, through a very intensive needs assessment and survey, uh, some goals that we thought this program should uh, work to achieve. And this is done in collaboration with the Virginia Outdoors Foundation. So our, our first goal is to um, create resilience to flooding and climate change impacts in Virginia's coastal communities. So that's kind of first and foremost, what are projects that will actually work to build resilience? We have a tree canopy issue in Virginia, and we definitely have a big issue on the coastal zone. And tree canopy is so important for the impacts of climate change related to heat, but we know that trees are a very important stormwater management tool and will help actually reduce flood risk on site due to their wonderful straw-like properties and sucking up all that, um, all that water. So the trees fund will fund tree planting to do just that. Our third goal is to build capacity uh, and this is this is really an important piece that I think makes this fund unique. We listened during this needs assessment and and listening tour um, to what our our partners are are really struggling with in this space and actually implementing resilience projects. And the 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 consistent theme that we heard is that capacity is a really, really big um, impediment. And so this grant, tries to fund projects that help organizations and communities get past that capacity uh, threshold. And so we want everybody to, we wanna solve all capacity issues everywhere. And of course that's impossible, but this grant program does offer a small way to, to do that in the coastal zone. Our last goal is that this fund raise public awareness about how important nature-based solutions are to increasing community resilience. And this is just an obvious one, but as you'll learn about the grant program through reading the manual and, and looking at the projects that have been funding funded in the past, um, this is a real opportunity for us to share the word about green infrastructure and about how nature can be a very, very strong tool to, uh, to build resilience and to uh, reduce the impacts of climate change uh, to community members in the coastal zone. So that's, that's goal number four. All right. So we have priorities that we think are important in projects that are funded through this, uh, through this grant program. Our priorities are that 
we are funding projects that have clear achievable goals and outcome and outcomes and that those projects will help um, meet the goals that have been established for the fund. So pretty obvious there, but um, definitely needs to be stated. If when you're applying, please be as clear as possible about what you're trying to do with the money that just helps everybody in, in doing the, the, the actual formal review for approval. We are motivated and care deeply about serving communities that have been underserved in the past. And so there is a lot of attention in the grant manual and in the scoring on how um, environmental justice communities can be um, served by these grant programs. So everyone is aware that communities with the greatest need have often um, been ignored historically. And so this, this grant program we really want to prioritize projects that will reach into those communities and provide some, some support and good projects and implementation of this work. We are really interested in how community members can be engaged in a meaningful way uh, in the creation of projects or in the implementation of projects funded through this grant program. Um, in our collaboratory work, which links university student teams with uh, community members or local governments. It's um, it's all about community engagement. We want uh, people's projects, we want our projects to be co-developed with residents. We think that that just provides the best outcome possible. So community members feel as though they have ownership over decisions that are being made in their community um, and on their properties in some instances. And so projects that do that engage in some way either in the planning stage or in the implementation stage are, are really gonna be um, great and in, in good alignment with this fund. Natural nature-based solutions, that's pretty darn obvious. Um, public outreach and education, if there are projects that are gonna increase awareness and help us with one of our goals of increasing public awareness, then that's gonna definitely be a priority for us. Um, public accessibility, that's a priority for um, should be a priority for everyone, certainly a priority for our partners with the Virginia Outdoors Foundation and, and Wetlands Watch is very interested in how we get more people in nature and um, along the shoreline so that when these big issues come up with climate change, there's a lot, there's more of a, um, in a level playing field in terms of awareness amongst the public. Uh, native plants, you'll see some references in the manual about the, the use of regionally native plants that will help support the existing ecosystem. And so that's definitely a priority that, that we have that you can see outlined in the manual. Um, finally, if it's hard to get money for this work, that is gonna make a big difference um, for, for us. Uh, we want to prioritize being a gap filler and that was what we really um, felt as though was needed after doing this big needs assessment last year. And so please, when you're applying, make sure you note that funding is, is tough to get and that will really help um, in, in the review as well. All right, a lot of priorities. Over to you, I think, Stacy. Um, so I get to talk a little bit about what we accomplished through this fund um, last year, um, which was the inaugural year. Um, we awarded $159,000 um, to 25 projects across the coastal zone. Um, uh, the lion's share of those went to nonprofit organizations, um, not because they were preferred, but because they submitted the most applications. Um, we had a fairly good spread of the types of organizations that received funding, um, and we were also fairly pleased with the geographic spread. Um, we reached all corners of um, the coastal zone with this funding, um, though we would certainly like to see even more diversity um, in this area. Uh, 17 of the projects um, were installed or are being installed um, in environmental justice communities. Um, we had eight public accessible sites where we um, funded invasive species removal um, and replacement with native plants. Um, and then we were able to fund planting of nearly a thousand native trees and shrubs across all projects. 
Um, so we feel like we have um, made some strides towards reaching some of the goals of the fund. I'm gonna talk a little bit about four specific projects that were funded. Um, the grant period for these um, does not close until um, late spring or summer, um, depending on which of the two rounds these projects were funded in last year. Um, so some of these are still ongoing. Um, the Nichols Park is a densely plant, uh, populated neighborhood of townhomes with small landscaped filter strips um, between the sidewalks and streets. This is located in Virginia Beach. Um, and originally um, large, rather unsuitable trees were planted um, in this space. Um, those trees were in poor condition and needed to be removed. They were causing damage to the sidewalks. And the HOA reached out to Lynn Haven River now um, for assistance to select appropriate native trees for the space. Um, and then Lenaben River now additionally recognized that there was a 6,000 square foot area of turf grass, which is shown in this picture, um, where some additional tree plantings could help um, manage that ponding stormwater that was occurring in the neighborhood. Um, we liked this project because it was initially um, brought to Lidhaven River now by the Neighborhood Association. So there's the community affiliation. Um, it hit three of the four goals of the fund and um, the trees then will be publicly accessible um, and benefit everybody who lives in this neighborhood. Um, the second project um, is the stewardship um, of the Bellmead Green Street project in Richmond. This was undertaken by the James River Association um, and the Bellmead Green Street was completed in 2021 um, and had since experienced some soil settling, plant death and loss of the mulch. Um, JRA and partners with Groundwork RVA um, and they've been working together on maintaining the space since 2019 um, when the first trees were planted there. Um, Groundwork RVA has a uh, youth-based conservation uh, workforce program called the Green Workforce. Um, that program launched in 2014, and it gives young people um, an opportunity to develop some conservation landscaping job skills, um, along with work ethics and um, a variety of soft skills. Um, and they use projects like the Bellamy Green Street um, across the city of Richmond as their classroom. Um, so the project basically um, centered around um, maintenance of planter beds, the filteras and a large bioretention basin that are placed along a half mile of this street in the Bellmead neighborhood. Um, the next project um, is also a Green Streets project, but this was um, constructing from nothing, a, a new Green Street area. Um, Greater Fulton is located at the eastern edge of Richmond and its commercial borders seat, serve three historically underserved neighborhoods. Um, there was an extensive partnership um, involved in this project. Um, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay was the applicant. Um, but they partnered with Innovate Fulton, Groundwork RVA, the Richmond Department of Public Utilities, and BHB Designs. Um, they engaged the community um, repeatedly in different um, type of listening sessions and got the feedback that what the community wanted were street improvements that provided shade, increased pedestrian safety, and provided beautification to the neighborhood. Um, so the partners got together and they designed a 14,000 square foot, uh, square feet of rain gardens, permeable sidewalks, um, conservation landscaping and tree plantings um, to achieve those goals. And the project also includes adding wheelchair accessible sidewalks and ramps within the project area, um, something that this area of the city is lacking. Um, the other notable thing about this project is um, the Alliance and Groundwork RBA, um, through their partnership, have created a program called Launch Fulton Green Jobs Initiative. Um, 
It provides hands-on training to Fulton residents ages 18 to 24 for green infrastructure and then connects them to employers. So it's very similar to the green workforce um, program that Groundwork RVA already had in place, but this is specific to the Fulton area and then it trains um, people who live in the area to help maintain the area. Um, and Groundwork RVA's green workforce are providing peer-based learning um, for launch participants as they assist in installing this project. The last one um, was a shoreline protection project um, on the Eastern Shore in Cape Charles. This was undertaken um, by the Eastern Shore chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalists. Um, the Savage Neck Dunes Natural Area Preserve um, has been experiencing some significant shoreline erosion due to both human and natural causes. There were a lot of social trails um, that were being carved out on the dunes as people sought to get access to the shoreline. Um, so the solution that the master naturalists came up with was to install low impact fencing um, along the established trails to discourage visitors from venturing off um, and creating more of these social tra um, trails. Uh, this dune habitat is home to the tiger beetle um, and they have actually lost significant acreage of suitable habitat um, over the years due to the extensive erosion that's been occurring there. Um, in addition to the fencing, um, they were replanting American beach grass on a section of dune and installing some sand fen fencing to help with capture. Um, that part of the project was being done under guidance from the Department of Conservation and Recreation's Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service, or SEAS. Um, and then they were also um, including interpretive signage that was going to um, provide visitors information about why this matters, why they should stay on the established trails, the risks to the sensitive habitats um, on the dunes, um, and encourage respect for those areas. All right, that's certainly not um, the full list. We've funded 25, but I just wanted to select um, kind of a representative sample, um, both size, scale, partnerships, um, geography, and give you some insight into what we have funded thus far. Um, the grant manual has gone through a few significant changes um, as we move into 2024. Um, we always kind of take a moment to step back, take a breath and look what we've done, evaluate um, our successes and failures um, and see how we can improve. So um, in the fall, we did this um, and we made um, a few changes the biggest one is probably we did away with the green infrastructure, shoreline protection, and tree planting as separate project categories and have combined those all into a single category um, that takes care of all of them, um, natural and nature-based infrastructure. So um, the same types of projects are still eligible for funding. Um, this is mostly an administrative um, and kind of visibility. We really want to drill down on the natural and nature-based solutions. Um, so that's for that change. There's $135,000 available to fund these projects this year. Uh, we do hope to give it all away in a single round. Um, last year we had two rounds, um, but we would really prefer to give it all away um, this spring, summer. Um, one of the really great things that we were able to do was to raise the max funding amounts for every category. Um, they've at least doubled from last year's funding amounts. Um, no categories have minimum funding um, and there's no match required on this grant. So um, we are very open to funding small projects, but we wanted to raise these maximum amounts um, to make it relevant to um, additional projects. Um, we have restricted private citizen eligibility to just the natural and nature-based infrastructure 
and stewardship programs. So um, individual citizens will not no longer be able to apply to um, capacity building. It just wasn't a good fit. Um, we're also not going to take the PDF applications anymore as this grant gets bigger. We have to look at um, some administrative concerns. And so we'll only be accepting applications through the web grants portal. Um, and we have revised that application. It's, if you applied last year and are applying again this year, that's going to look a little bit different. Um, all the main components um, are the same. Um, we've just added a few additional questions to get into some more details about the project, the project site, those kinds of things. Um, okay, so um, except for um, private citizens not being able to apply to capacity, build, uh, capacity building, there have not been any other changes relative to um, applicant eligibility. It's still restricted to areas within Virginia's coastal zone um, defined by the coastal zone management program. Um, the counties, cities, independent towns um, then incorporate that. Um, projects should be shovel ready and they can be already underway, especially if it's a large project and you intend to ask for funding for just a portion of it. Um, it's fine if the project has already been started with other funding sources. Um, it's just the part um, that would be funded through this stream um, needs to be um, needs to happen during the grant period. Um, and then those portion projects or portions of projects um, need to be completed by the end of May next year, 2025. Um, and um, I am available to discuss potential proposals, answer any questions um, after this webinar. Um, our email is on the last slide, so feel free to reach out to me anytime and we can set up um, some time to discuss further. All right, so um, now we have three categories uh, and I wanted to give a little bit of information about what kind of projects um, we expect to see in those categories. So um, under capaci capacity building, excuse me, um, we have all of the same um, example projects that we had last year staff training and certifications, um, the fees associated with design planning or permitting resilience projects, um, development of long-term or adaptive plans, studies, reports, and tools. Um, and then we have added um, activities that increase the availability of native plants for use in resilience projects and training volunteers to participate in resilience efforts as specific examples. They were always allowed, um, but these were areas that we got some specific questions on um, whether or not those types of things would be eligible, and they are. Um, under the natural and nature-based infrastructure, we've got all the green infrastructure, living shorelines, riparian buffers, tree and shrub plantings. Um, but we also wanted to call out any projects um, that are focused on habitat creation or restoration would also be eligible in this category. Um, and then as well as cost share matches. So if you are working with a cost share program um, that is able to take state funds as um, matching funds as the property owner's cost share match, um, then we invite those applications as well. Um, and we've raised the per project limit to $25,000 up from 10 last year. Um, and then stewardship, um, this is getting into all of your maintenance activities, the invasive species removal, plant replacement, as well as monitoring projects. Um, and we have also doubled that from five to 10,000 per project. Um, so, when we get to project selection, 
Um, we do have a multi-level review, either the Wetlands Watch staff or um, VOF staff committee um, does a first level of review. We look at a lot of the objective criteria involved in these proposals, um, making sure that you're in an eligible location, um, verifying whether or not it's an environmental justice community, some of those types of things. Um, Wetlands Watch primarily does this, um, but in the case where there may be a conflict of interest, um, where we are partnering, the VOF staff has a committee um, that can take on that responsibility. We also have a technical advisory committee, um, and they um, have an extensive um, review that they go through on the technical merits of the project, and we take those raw scores plus recommendations for funding. Um, from that committee. So each project can score total possible points of 370. Um, and I've broken that down for you. I'm not going to read through all of it. Um, details about each of these scoring areas are um, in the grant manual, a lot of details. Um, but if you run into anything you have questions about, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and then final selection is based on three factors. There's raw scores from the reviews, the recommendations from the technical advisory committee, and then the available funding. Um, this year's timeline, uh, we do plan to open the grant portal um, no later than the 1st of February. Um, we're hoping to get it the last week of January, but um, if you're attending this, you'll get an email notification when that grant portal opens up. Um, proposals are gonna be due April 5th, and then we'll go into the review period. Um, by the end of May, everybody will know whether or not they have been awarded, um, and you'll get grant agreements within about two weeks of that. Um, those are gonna be due back August 23rd, and then you have until May 31st to complete the project with the final report due 60 days later. Um, we do have a template for that report. Um, there is a process for interim reports. If you, you know, we get to September and you say, oh, this didn't work out. We need to kind of shift a little bit. Um, there are allowances for that in the grant agreement um, and then ways to modify the project if needed along the way, as well as um, to request an extension if you just need a little bit more time, the weather hasn't cooperated or whatever. Uh, we're very flexible in those regards. All right, so I mentioned that all of the applications have to come through the grant portal beginning this year. Um, you do have to register for this portal. There um, are links on the VOF website, um, also on wetlandswatch.org. Um, once you register, um, either myself or the BOF staff have to go in and approve you as a user. Um, <clears throat> so don't wait until the 11th hour on the last day to do that, you might miss it. Um, give yourself at least 24 hours um, to get that registration approval back. Um, and then you're gonna, during that registration, uh, process, you're going to choose um, your program area of interest as the Coastal Resilience Tree Fund. Um, then you're going to get an email that gives you a temporary login. So you'll log in, you'll update all of that information to what you really want it to be, um, and then you'll come into this dashboard. And you want to click on Funding Opportunities, which is going to open up um, <clears throat> those that you can apply for, select the one for the CRTF. Um, and then you'll use the green start a new application um, to get started. You can save your application. Um, you don't have to complete it all in one go. So um, if you do that, you come back, you wanna work on it some more, you'll find um, it'll have this editing status and you'll be able to click in um, to continue working on it. There are several um, uploads that will need to be part of the application. Um, please pay attention to the lists that are included in the manual. 
they will also be part of the application. Um, but your application will not be considered complete if those uploads are not um, included. So you can look, um, if you decide that you do not want to finish your application, um, when you click into the details for your started application, there is the opportunity to withdraw it. Um, we hope you don't. Um, but if circumstances insist, then that is an option for you. Um, and then just some final notes, we will be adding um, resources. Uh, last year's are up there. We'll be updating those for the 2024 round. Um, so our website, we have a dedicated grants page for this. Um, so the full grant manual will be available. All of the scoring criteria, the checklist for what should be included in your proposal, um, in those uploads. And then we have some templates to help you plan um, a maintenance plan for your green, your natural nature-based infrastructure projects, budgets for any type of project. Um, there's some guidance on green infrastructure as well as some links in that document to additional guidance. So if you need some technical help. Um, and then the tool that we use to identify environmental justice communities um, is linked there as well. We use um, EJ Screen Plus, which was developed by Virginia DEQ. Um, you can use other tools. You just have to let us know what you've used. Um, and there's a section for that in the application. And that's it. So now it's time for your questions. So we already have a lot of questions. Everybody's been using the chat, which is wonderful. So we've got some queued up. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Kit has asked um, or pointed out correctly that the website still has the 2023 grant round information and wondering um, if the manual will be updated sometime soon. So we we already know that the manual is um, has been updated. And so the updated version is really the question. When? Um, early, very early next week. I just have to do a couple of formatting things and it's ready to push out. Great. And the website will be modified with the new timeline and all of those important details as well. Um, Kit and everybody else on the call. Yes. Okay. Hank has asked a good question that um, is interesting, hasn't come up yet. Uh, will extra points be given if an applicant provides matching funds? Not exactly. So the way we look at the funding um, for these projects, um, there are opportunities within the application um, to list the full cost of the project, which may be different than what you are requesting from this grant. So let's say you're in a multi-phase large project and it's gonna cost $100,000 um, and all of it's funded, but you need a little bit more money for one particular area. Um, so you would put $100,000 as the total cost. Um, you would include in your actual budget only those costs associated with this grant. Um, but then you would provide other funding sources. There's a separate area for that just to show that you are able to meet the full project costs. Um, you know, for us looking at these, if we see a $100,000 project and you're asking for $10,000, we very rightly wonder where that other 90,000 is coming from and do you want some kind of information um, about that so that we know we're not just putting 10,000 out there and then you're still continuing to fundraise and the project may not come to fruition within the period of the grant. Um, but there aren't bonus points for that in the review. Good. 
Um, Barbara Gavin has asked, um, would capacity building include costs to attend trainings and conferences? Yes, absolutely. We're just cruising through these. Danielle um, from Virginia Beach asks, the current manual states that funding for new staff positions are ineligible. Can a portion of the funds for a project go to an existing staff position? Yes. 10% um, of grant funds can go towards um, staff salaries. Awesome. So Heather asked a question, but then she said, just kidding, you answered it about um, a school retention pond having a lot of frag um, over taking it. Um, okay, Meredith has asked, uh, can an individual entity apply for more than one project? Yes, absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> you can apply um, two proposals in either capacity building um, or stewardship and up to four in the natural and nature-based infrastructure. So conceivably a single entity could submit eight applications. They do all have to be submitted individually. Um, Meredith asked another question um, about the EJ data, which portal, and it's been provided. Thank you, Heather, for putting the link in. And just to reiterate, you know, this is the EJ screen viewer that we've identified. Um, however, you can use an alternative uh, EJ um, determination. And we really want to be sure that we're being flexible to the, the number of ways in which um, an EJ community or underserved community could be represented. Um, the EJ screener pulls from census data and it's it's the best that we have, but there are certainly other ways to um, to show that the project would benefit those communities. So please just know that. Um, Katie Grigsby, um, if we have not received a permit for a living shoreline, but anticipate to have it by the beginning of the summer, could that project still be eligible? It's a great question. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I didn't put it in the slides because I didn't want to um, cause confusion. Uh, last year, we did require that all permits be in hand before you applied. Um, and that proved to be incredibly problematic um, and really beyond the control of the applicant. So we are just saying that it is your responsibility to get all of those permits before you start construction on your project, um, which would be the case regardless of how the project was funded. And um, we are not asking specifically for that information um, in terms of this grant. I will be checking public records um, if it's a project that should have a permit to kind of make sure that what's submitted to us matches up with what's been submitted on the permit. Um, but other than that, um, we're not gonna be considering permits for this round. Um, Meredith also asked, are the slides going out after this? And the answer is yes, they'll be posted on the website. Um, and the Katie's follow-up question, yes. Very helpful if you include your, um, there's an area for you to, um, on the application for you to um, submit any kind of supplemental um, documents to bolster your proposal. Um, these could be letters of support, they could be environmental studies, they could be really anything that you want to submit that says, hey, this wasn't really captured in the application, but you should consider this information as well. Um, so you can upload your permit documents to that or just a Word document with the permit number. Anything like that is helpful.
that is all of the questions in the chat. If y'all want to come off of mute and ask your questions that way, please do. It's a casual group. Hank, uh, if we intend to use a private contractor to do plantings, do we need multiple bids? Um, you may want to get multiple bids um, so that you're selecting the best value for your money, but we don't need them. <laughs> That's a good question. Surprised that hasn't come up. Any other questions? Any discussion? Hey, Mary Carson, I have a quick question. I'm here with King George County supporting them. And um, we saw on an earlier slide that there was a funded project and we don't, we're not sure what the project is. Does anyone remember what King George County applied for? And I can't find it on the website. Unless I haven't looked closely enough. <laughs> um, so I, I believe that the King George project was a private shoreline. Gotcha. So it wouldn't like affect our ability as the county to apply for other projects on the parkland. Oh, absolutely not. No. Perfect. No, there's if every application came from Norfolk, we would fund all Norfolk projects. There's no um, geographic limit like that, um, as long as they come from different entities. Good question. Hey guys, sorry, this is Katie. I don't mean to monopolize a bunch of questions, but um, uh, this is kind of on the same realm of what Barbara was asking. If somebody was wanting to go for a class B contractor's license, would that be considered a, um, you know, some type of capacity building kind of thing or like kind of workshop situation? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Katie, you're going to become a contractor? Yeah, might as well be, right? <laughs> yeah, so we do encourage that you, you know, if you have some questions, you think a project is kind of iffy, whether or not it fits, um, send us an email. We'll have a conversation um, and can provide some guidance. But we really built this to be flexible and reactive to your needs. So we want to give the money away. We want to fund good projects. We want to fund capacity building. Um, we really, really want to help you um, in any way that we can. So assume that there's a way it can be eligible until we tell you it's not um, and have a discussion with us. Um, and it, it may be that you're thinking it goes in this category and we're like, mm, you may have to take two steps back and put it in this category um, and do some planning work first. Um, but then <clears throat> applying in one round does not make you ineligible to apply for future money, um, especially if it's um, moving a project along. So if you, if you applied in one round for planning money, that capacity building category, because you need to have somebody come in and help you develop a plan. You need a consultant or you need internal time in your organization um, to do some outreach. That can be a capacity um, building project. And then in a, a follow-up round, whenever you're ready, you could submit as a separate project on the implementation phase and get money to actually put all of that planning into effect as an actual project. Um, and we have someone on the call tonight, today, I'm not gonna call her out, um, but she did just that. She had a capacity building project in our very first round last spring. Um, and hopefully she's very close to being able to apply for some implementation funding for this round. Yes, Julie, um, we'll post the slides on the website. 
um, we can we can send a follow up email to everybody that's attended today uh, with the slides attached. That's no problem. Um, the website that the link's been in the chat. Um, that will also include a video recording of the webinar. And so if there's someone on your on your staff or in your community that you think is interested, um, you can just forward this link on to them and they can uh, listen along as well. Any last questions? Mm, yep, Shereen put a note about CBLP level one training. I would also mention that we have a Brownfields design charrette coming up um, the first week of February. It's gonna be February 6th online and February 8th in person. Um, that um, we're still, we're taking registrations for right now. So if you're interested, reach out and we'll get you that registration link. Um, it's going to be the first day is informational, and then the second day is um, application. So you'll be helping to design a brownfield site uh, in Chesapeake. Well, we're finishing this meeting early, so you're welcome for yep. the extra four minutes of your life back. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye.